Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Joel Levine from the Graduate School. I want to welcome you all to the last uh, installment in the Provost Graduate Student Lecture Series for the spring semester. Uh, this is really, I think, a great way to end. I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Christian Formoso, from the Hispanic uh, Languages, uh, a doctoral candidate in the Hispanic Languages and Culture Studies. He received his BA in Chile and a master's degree in Hispanic uh, Languages and Studies from Villanova. And I'm sure, as you're all aware, not only is he an accomplished scholar, but he's an extremely accomplished and well-known poet. Uh, we're very happy to have him here today, and I'm going to let his advisor tell you a lot more about his accomplishments here at Stony Brook and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be very brief. We are a little bit concerned about time. We had a problem with, uh, with the PowerPoint. Uh, it's, a, it's a great joy for me. It's a, uh, it's a pleasure, an uh, honor to introduce uh, Cristian Formoso, who as was said, is one of our uh, doctoral candidates in the Department of Hispanic Languages and Literature. Uh, he's about to finish his dissertation, and we have, uh, it's a fresh, new, the very last version of the title. I have it so far. I will read it in Spanish in its original language. It will be Heterotopias Magallanicas, Narrativas Imperiales, Nacionales y Originarias. And pretty much the talk today will be a, a, a great, uh, synthesis, I guess, of, of the whole project. So it's a very, very ambitious uh, talk. So I'll be brief. I would like just to say two things that I have learned a lot from my interaction with Christian. Uh, it has been not only a joy, as I said, but a, a very, you know, learning uh, process for me as well. Uh, he's a respected poet. Uh, he has been awarded very important uh, prizes in, in, in Chile and in Latin America in general. Uh, and that uh, perception of, of the world and, and his use of language as a poet, I guess is also very palpable, very visible in his work. And uh, without any, any um, more words, I will just leave you with uh, Christian. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really honored to be here. I do uh, thank the Provost Office and the Graduate School and the Department for having proposed this uh, uh, work for, for, for this series. And um, I want to thank Katie and Paul and Adrienne for the support. I will start right away. Uh, since I have introduced this presentation as a form of uh, travel or journey, and a journey needs map, we will start by commenting on some of them, considering that the personal journey of readings which gave origin to this project started precisely by looking at maps and tracing a journey on map themselves. I don't remember the exact year during the 90s, but I clearly recall the impression I had the first time I opened the poetry book De la Tierra Sin Fuego, from the Fireless Land, by Juan Pablo Riveros. Mm. Um, the work is considered the first that addresses directly the genocide of the southern indigenous people on the Chilean literary map, and it precisely opens with a non-official non ethnographic map of the Strait of Magellan and the Fireland that, more than inscribing, represented at different levels a deletion. Firstly, because the Chilean-Argentinian border is omitted, but more importantly, because of its heading, Fireland before its disappearance. The phrase echoes the explicit mark of absence de depicted in the title of the book. But in addition, it inscribes the disappearance in the geography, deleting part of the territory and leaving the map as a sort of memento that makes the reader face a time different from their own. The synecdoche that the map also proposes in which the indigenous equals the land and the disappearance of the indigenous implies the deletion of the space consequently entails a deletion of the contemporary trace of these people. Much later, but with a similar sense of perplexity, I found the cartographic illustration of the manuscript of the first voyage around the world, included in the Nancy Library Phillips Beinecke Yale Codex, which incorporates the first map of the Strait of Magellan drawn by Antonio Pigafetta, its author, 
who was part of Ferdinand Magellan's expedition in 1520. The important thing for me, the names of the ocean and geographical features appear to be curiously inverted. The Pacific Ocean on the right and continental Patagonia in the inferior portion of the drawing. My contemporary sensibility told me it was a sort of mirror inverted from how I was used to seeing cartography. Finally, in August 2014, Juan Carlos Tonco, the leader of the Cahuescar community and author of one of the videos I was looking for my project, gave me a copy of the Ethno Ethnogeographic Guide of Bernardo Higgins National Park, published in 2012. I found a map of the Chilean Patagonian channels um, that showed, showed the channels under the name of Cahuescar territory. That image, among many, many other connotations, proposes a juxtaposition of the indigenous space upon the national map in an exercise that is both representative and contesting of the political and representational Chilean and Occidental space. I must confess that these cartographic perplexities were preceded by readings that I had fed my manner of seeing the maps. Briefly, and it's in a flashback, I could go back to my first readings of the Latin American boom to find Julio Cortázar's instructions on how to cry, indicated that in order to do it, I had to veer to steer my imagination towards those gulfs in the Strait of Magellan into which no one ever sails. Later, I found that that space of crying was also associated with Magallanes in the Aonikink cosmogony, the giants of Patagonia, when the spirit of coach, surrounded by shadows, started to cry and whose tears formed the sea where life started to inhabit the future world. Moreover, popular urban myths, which accumulated a sense of difference for Magallanes, for Magellan people, had started addressing me early, since in epochs previous to the internet, the usual question asked to Magellan people who visited the capital of the country, partially as a joke and partially as a sort of real concern, was if they had a penguin instead of a dog as a pet. Or when I still hear nowadays that in Punta Arenas we have the most beautiful cemetery of the country, and according to CNN, the sixth most beautiful cemetery in the world. Or what the toponymy, toponymy shows, Port Famine, Desolation Bay, Last Hope, that sense of otherness throughout the years multiplied by hundreds its examples in literary references. And somehow, in all of them, I found a territorial and a representational Magallanes that as soon as it was connected with a series of central and distant territories and representations appeared in many aspects, as we have seen, mirroring them, questioning or invert, inverting them. Other readings led me to find the concept of heterotopia by Michel Foucault, and I was amazed at the similarities between the examples he proposes to read the space and the way in which Magallanes has been represented. According to Foucault, there are two types of places that are linked and yet contradict all other sites. All other sites. The first are utopias and real spaces that have a general relation of direct or invent, inverted analogy with the real space of society, presented it in a perfected form or turned upside down. And the second, that exists in every culture, probably formed in the very founding of societies, which are something like counter sites, where all the other real sites of the culture are simul simultane simultaneously represented, contested, and inverted. They are outside of all the places, even though it is possible to indicate their location. And he calls them heterotopias. Foucault identifies some principles to describe, to describe heterotopias. He states, firstly, that not a single culture in the world fails to constitute heterotopias. And within that, that there is a category called heterotopias of deviation, which are those places in which individuals whose behavior is deviant in relation to their required mean or norm are placed prisons, for instance. Secondly, that the same heterotopia can, according to the synchrony of the culture in which it occurs, have one function or another, and he mentions the strange heterotopia of the cemetery as an example of that. Thirdly, the heterotopia is capable of juxtaposing in a single real place several spaces that are in themselves incompatible. Fourthly, the heterotopias function at full capacity 
when men arrive at a sort of absolute break with the traditional time. The fifth characteristic is that they always presuppose a system of opening and closing that both isolate them and make them penetrable. Either the entry is compulsory there, as in the case of entering a prison, or to get in, one must have a certain permission and make certain gestures. The last trait of heterotopias is that they have a function in relation to all other spaces that remains. This is either to create a space of illusion that exposes even real, every real space as still more illusory, or on the contrary, to create a space as perfect, as meticulous, as well arranged as ours is messy, is contracted, and jumbled, which is called heterotopia of compensation. Finally, Foucault's Foucault chooses the sheep as the Terotopia par excellence. He defines it as a floating piece of space, a place without a place, that exists by itself, that is closed in on itself, and at the same time, at the same time is given over to the infinity of the sea. The sheep for Foucault represents the greatest reserve of the imagination. In those civilizations that lack of them, dreams dry up, espionage, takes the place of adventure, and the police take the place of pirates. Police and pirates, espionage and adventures, are images that for me seem to have been dueling by the shores of the Strait for a long time. However, I had noticed that there were meaningful bonds between those representations and Magallanes' otherness, and the political context in which they were created, and, they, and that they used certain characteristics of the territory to represent it in different heterotopic manners. Moreover, that most of those representations use that otherness in a functional manner with respect to the hegemonic political project in which they were created. And some others, using otherness as well, challenge that hegemonic project opening spaces of circulation of new forms of sensibility, participation and references, avoiding the imposition of a series of values upon some of the groups and challenging the common sense socially built for the hegemonic ideas of the epoch. They are what I will call from now on hegemonic heterotopias and counter-hegemonic heterotopias. My research here extends from the initial construction of the heterotopic Magallanes in the colonial period, with works produced in the peninsula and the Viceroyalty of Peru that covered the period between 1520, with the arrival of Magellan to the shores of the Strait, and 15. 87, the moment in which the project of colonizing the territories find a definite defeat. After that, we find that the natural moment from 1843, when Chile took over the territory on, to finally come to see by the beginning of the 21st century, the moment in which the space of the indigenous people is finally recovered through their own voices and views. We will see part of this in an attempt to capture the spirit of what inspired this research to connect the contemporary with the historic and traditional in such a way that established sources of power could be questioned and interrupted if necessary. There are a series of representations, or, or representations originating in the first moment of the chronicles of the territory that would be convenient to start with in two important texts. We mentioned First Voyage Round the World by Antonio Pigafetta, which tells the events of the first expedition to reach the Strait of Magellan and circumnavigate the world under the command of Ferdinand Magellan I and Juan Sebastián Elcano later. It is an inaugural chronicle that, apart from inscribing the name Patagonia for the area, establishes the ground for the myth through which Patagonia will be explored later. And then Voyages of the Strait of Magellan by Pedro Sarmiento de Gamboa, with which, which gives account of the attempt and definite failure of the settlement on the shores of the Strait by the Spanish crown between 1580 and 1584. Each one of them corresponds to a specific moment in the project of expansion of the Spanish empire. They are functional to those moments, and they start providing the groundwork of a community of common sense associated with the territories of the Strait, with elements and descriptions that will be collected in subsequent texts. Precisely, one that assumes and develops what they started is Armas Antarcticas. No doubt that the events have been caused by the divine providence. It is 1609, and Juan de Miramonte Suazola has finished in Peru the writing of Armas Antarcticas. 25 years have passed since the events that he mentions in the verses, the, the failure of Sarmiento's fortification of the strait after the deep impact that the navigation of Francis Drake through the channel in 1578 meant for the Spanish crown, and the death of the 300 
Spanish settlers that remained on the shores between 1584 and 1587. The Divine Providence is the figure that somehow allows the poet to explain that dark and opaque point in the history of the Spanish imperial expansion. Since the political view of the poem is related to the genre itself, as Paul Filvas reminds us, what we can see in Armas Antarcticas is how the explanation for the defeat of Sarmiento's endeavor, which is to say the Spanish failure, wants to be assumed as a victory not only through the creation of a poem, but through the creation of a Magellan space essentially burdened with attributes that make the events inevitable. The territory of the strait, as a complement of divine will, will be the only entity responsible for the political failure of the Spanish crown. If Foucault defines heterotopia through the links they have with other places in order to contradict them, we see them in Miramontes in an imperial series that relates the Spanish peninsula, the strait, and the viceroyalty of Peru. And the first element we notice in that series is the effect of distance on the construction of Magallanes as an inverted and opposite side to the two others. The first stanza that talk about Magallanes develops its political importance to reinforce the stability of the empire through the control and occupation of the Strait of Magellan. Although the political purposes appear secondary in comparison to the work of evangelism. These traces of religion and nationality start to define the heterotopic images, images of Magallanes in a series of oppositions between Spain and Magallanes, but mainly between Magallanes and Peru, because the poem is organized around Lima as the center of the colonial world. Lima is presented at the beginning of Sarmiento's journey using adjectives like fertile, calm, and pleasant that describe a spiritual, productive, and paradisiacal environment. The strait, in contrast, throughout the poem, features a geography and a nature adverse than negative. Extreme, intolerable, sunless, strong winds, cold and damaging, that accumulates meanings to make of Magallanes the countersite of Lima and the peninsula. Those negative elements, in fact, are in harmony with what inhabits the strait, what controls them somehow, and what provokes certain effect in people who will have contact with their territory. It is the devil that is adored in that landscape, and its cult comes from the moral effect of the space on humans. And this idea of the devil controlling Magellan space also entails a political genealogy, since Miramontes claims that the reason for the British to use the strait is one of a di diabolic inspiration. The relation of Magallanes with heterotopias of deviation and with a system of opening and closing that both isolates and makes heterotopia penetrable is only enunciated at this point and related to the experience of Sarmiento. The interesting thing here is how the idea of fortifying the territory and the prison-like connotations of Miramonte language to describe it provoke a sort of inversion of those heterotopias. Because if the idea is to lock up the ones with deviant behavior, what occurs in Magallanes is the, attem is the attempt to activate the system of opening and closing to lock up the territory but leave those deviated the British who religiously deviate from the Spanish crown norm out of this heterotopic space. What we can see here, nevertheless, is what Foucault calls the juxtaposition of multiple incompatible spaces, which means that heterotopia can imply the generation of spaces as paradoxical, uh, like a prison in which the deviated can enter. In Miramontes' Strait, we can also find that men arrive at a sort of absolute break with their traditional time since the Spaniards face a strait described as lacking of cult and reason, which will also provoke dramatic effects on them, as in a scene of cannibalism practiced by a Spaniard who has suffered the effects of that break with his time. In relation to the indigenous people, in general, the poem does not differ greatly from its previous sources and tradition. Even though in some cases the descriptions are milder, the Patagonians describe Pigafetta as a strong, fast, agile, and gigantic. In Miramontes sometimes turn out to be only semi-gigantic. Miramontes as Pigafetta and Sarmiento before him links the indigenous to the devil, but again ambiguously, because the Indians might be the subjects of a miracle as well, as in the scene in which they are inspired by the image of a cross and decide <clears throat> to examine a Spaniard's body to bury under that image a dead member of the group. In that scene, the damage of, to the Spanish body is ambiguous to the divine inspiration and the representation of the indigenous people continues the process of homogenization that Pigafetta had started. 
Mm. We will leave um, the space of the colony behind now, and we will travel to 1843. Chile is an independent nation and, at that point and resumes the project of occupation of the Strait of Magellan since after uh, Sarmiento, the defeat was total and the Spanish crown um, <clears throat> abandoned the project of making any attempt of uh, settling there again. Um, in a strict sense, what Chile does is to adapt and complete the imperial's ideas of controlling that space through fortifications and prisons, making of it a proper heterotopia of deviation, which is officially stated with the foundation of Fuerte Bulnes in that year and of the penal colony, colony of Punta Arenas in 1848. It is a national heterotopia of deviation that will work for about 40 years. In my um, native land, Panorama Reminiscences, Writers and Folklore, published in London by the Chilean um, writer Agustin Edward McClure in 1923, there is an epigraph that opens the chapter dedicated to Magallanes and to the British readers. It shows that the first change we will notice at least in the official policy related to the administration of the territory as an effect of two violent riots, El Motín de Cambiaso in 1851 and El Motín de los Artilleros in 1877. With hundreds of dead people there. So they changed the policy of, of occupation of the Strait. The Strait of Magellan is and remains neutralized in perpetuity and its free navigation is assured to the flags of all the nations, right? This formulation in English, in a text of international divulgation, is a sort of image of the hegemonic, central, and governmental view of the Magellan territory. Basically, it shows that the repeated attempts to fortify and control the space of the Strait by the Spanish crown first, and by the Chilean nation later, seized for the Chilean and international governments and for the readers of the world by decree in 1881 with the Treaty of Frontiers between Chile and Argentina. Nevertheless, that decree implies the end of the official policies of the heterotopia of deviation, but not necessarily the end of the heterotopic representation of Magallanes. In fact, during, during the 20th century, we will continue to find them. Only one example here, Benjamín Suer Casos Chile o una loca geografía, probably the most important geographical essay published in Chile in the era. In that work, in addition to being an irrational place, inaccessible to memory, Magallanes geography is once more described like an inversion. A sunken piece of Chile in which the central valley is prolonged by the bottom of the sea and the channels are where the ranges emerge in the form of islands. This book was published in 1940, and the rep representations, as we can see, have kept on accumulating and reproducing since the imperial moment. The relation with the foreign elements associated with the strait, represented by the British for the Spanish Empire and for the borders treaty between Chile and Argentina, will remain an issue during the, the whole 20th century, especially when the Chilean state decides to claim sovereignty in the Antarctic and to associate Antarctica to Magallanes. That claim, in fact, had started by the end of the 19th century, considering that after independence, the American republics of the Spanish crown kept the territories that had been assigned as a promise of the empire. In that context, the city of Punta Arenas was a point of reference for almost all the first Antarctic expeditions, which for Chile officially started in 1947 with the first Chilean Antarctic Commission. On that occasion, Chile took possession of a part of the white continent and inaugurated the first national station, even though in 1959, Chile had to sign the Antarctic Treaty together with other countries that had installed scientific stations on the territory. That treaty took effect in 1961, and it established that Antarctica would be used with peaceful objectives, forbidding any military activity, but granting in exchange freedom for scientific research in addition, it states that no acts or activities taking place while the treaty is in force shall constitute a basis for asserting, supporting, or denying a claim to territorial sovereignty. Since then, Chile has maintained a policy of territorial occupation and military administration of its stations, but focused on the support of scientific and cultural initiatives. Later, during the Augusto Pinochet dictatorship in 1975, the relation between the Antarctic and Magallanes became official when the name of the region was changed to Magallanes and the Chilean Antarctica. And since 2003, the Chilean Antarctic Institute, INACH, has been operating in Punta Arenas. 
Since 1947 also, with the visit of writers and artists, and since 2011, with the creation of the regional, regional SEAL cultural program and the initiative Proyecto A, the Chilean government has been financing a series of representation to increase the community, in the community, the sense of belonging to the natural, historical, and scientific patrimony of the Antarctic and the preceding territories. These are the political, social, and symbolic programs and declarations that the Chilean government has developed in order to make explicit, expansive intention and its claim for sovereignty of the white continent and its annexation to Magallanes. Proyecto A, in that line, was strongly focused on the relation amongst art, science, technology, and the Antarctic, showing through artistic creations funded by the government how these elements connect. Paola Besani, a Magellan artist, director of the Regional Council of Culture and the creator of Proyecto A, stated that the idea of relating those elements in the Antarctic correspond to a desire to put into practice the spirit, objective, and fundamentals of the Antarctic Treaty that is peace, collaboration, environmental care, and scientific research. Besani remarks that being in the Antarctica, you get immersed in that sense, and it's impossible not to look at this wonderful relationship among humans that way, which is utopic. At this point, what we can read in the phenomena of the Chilean Antarctic, more than utopia, is a sort of heterotopia of compensation. Certainly, Antarctica is the opposite of utopia, since we can find it on the map. And beyond that, it has a function in relation to the rest of the national and international space developed through science and art. Antarctica is as perfect, as meticulous, as well arranged as our countries are messy, ill-constructed, and jumbled in international disputes of borders, environmental damage, and competition instead of collaboration. It is also necessary to mention here that this equation of Antarctic science and, science and art would also have to balance cooperation and sovereignty appropriation, sense of belonging, and territorial annexation, entailing in the end contradictions too difficult to resolve. The challenge that some of those contradictions represent for Chile can be seen in two documentaries. El Continente de la Luz, Primeras Expediciones a la Antártica, released in 2012, and Insula in Alvis, released in 2013. They show the displacement from the idea of a patriotic duty and deed which is what inspired the first Chilean claims prior to the Antarctic Treaty, toward a post-treaty view, which allows the creation of a Chilean Antarctic that operates with the logic of heterotopia, constructing another space of nationality created vicariously in the space of representations. El Continente de la Luz compiles original images from the first three Chilean expeditions to Antarctica between 1947 and 1949. The images were lost, recovered in 2011, and later published in 2012. This work ends up articulating a sort of hybrid perspective, since the images show a view typical of the moment prior to the treaty, patriotic duty and a strong military presence, but the post-treaty effect is in the view of its director, Rafael Chauquelaf, and of the era in which the images are assembled. The idea of heroic feats and national context, conquest is built through the register of every official military operation on the territory of the omnipresent national emblems and a cross. As is shown in the visit uh, of the Chilean crew to the British station of Puerto Locroy, both cooperation and international dispute of sovereignty occur. Let's see if we can use this. We can see that here, the national Chilean claim, you see they are in this uh, British uh, station, and this is what they do. That's exactly what they do, right? And they laugh. Um, we can see here that um, the national Chilean claim symbolized by the emblem which is superimposed on the images of the British place. The following chart somehow offers a synthesis of the view of the documentary. It shows a football match between a Chilean and a British team that ends in a 1-1 one, one draw. The images in slow motion, previous to the text, recover the past for the contemporary spectator. The current situation is described as a consecration, uh, which in a sense, El territorio se declara consagrado, consecrated, right? 
Um, right, which in a sense ends up tying the flag and the image of the cross to the utopia of international cooperation, contemporary to the moment of edition. The images of the football, ma the football match end up being an allegory of the tie ending that the treaty proposes, configuring at the same time the tensions of this recovery. Uh, I was going to show you this. Uh, this is a different, um, the second uh, documentary. It just, uh, it has, was uh, done in 2013, and it follows, it traces all the symbols, Chilean symbols, in every surface they can. Uh, but also, uh, they talk about the um, cooperation, international cooperation. So that's a sort of synthesis of what they want to show here, right? The important thing, apart from this, all these hegemonic uh, symbols that they show, is this, right? <coughs> At the cafeteria of the airfield of Rey Jorge Island, there is a gultrun, the ceremonial drum of a Mapuche machi and the collón, a Mapuche mask used in ceremonies like Guillatun and games like Palin. The presence of such spiritual elements of that subaltern and distant indigenous world opens connotations that we can read here as a way of putting into circulation other subjectivities in the space of national hegemony. Mm. What, we seen, what we have seen up to here then is that the cultural products created within the frame of these Antarctic initiatives represent somehow a new heterotopia of special, of special, special control, control, since through the discourses they work to bring about the dream of annexation of the white continent to national borders. The Chilean Antarctica, realized in that way, operates within the frames of heterotopia, creating another space of sovereignty that inverts and contests, firstly, the restrictions imposed by the international treaty. They create a Chilean Antarctica, but that at the same time, and considering its spaces of cooperation, it also ends up inverting and contesting the mechanism of sovereign dispute of the political world map, without forgetting certainly that we are in the space of hegemonic interest. Coming to this point, we have to consider that the national representations we have been seeing are defined by the Creole and hegemonic national project that does not include in its territory the indigenous world. Nonetheless, indigenous people have been represented and included in most of these works. In the Antarctic representations, apart from what Juvia Acida has symbolically done here, symbolically, symbolically, symbolically done here, we can find what the Chilean writer Miguel Serrano did in his book La Antarctica y otros mitos of 1948. Serrano took part of the first Chilean commission to the Antarctic in 1947, and in one moment of his narration, he tells his experience of meeting a group of Cahuescar people. His description concurs with some previous representations produced by other writers of the national moment we have already mentioned. Edwards, for instance, represented the Cahuescar people as owners of an uncivilized wretchedness, as idiots and abject. Suber Casso displays their presence to the margin of history. For him, they are a group that has lived knowing nothing at all and that maintains itself hunting sea wolves in an agonizing state. For Serrano, finally, the Cahuescar constitutes something like a residue of another time. We can, we can still see their heads, eyes, and stiff hair, which is a sister of the Manu tree branches, he says, but they are people that, in the end, we must let disappear in the slow fall towards a flooded and rotten ground. This idea of imminent disappearance of the Cahuescar people is also absurd in the documentary <clears throat> Life at the End of the World by the French explorer Jacques Cousteau, released in 1975. Apart from the sort of technological renewal of the imperial endeavor that repeats the heterotopic connotations historically associated with Magallanes, think of the title, this time through air and submarine shots that constitute, in his own words, a new era of discovery, the important thing for us is how he represents the Cahuesca people. Cousteau reveals that the purpose of the trip is to research about the terrible condition of the people that he calls Kaweshkar, people who never, since the arrival of Europeans, have found balance, as he, as he will strive to show. Gusto narrates that there are only five Kaweshkar families in Puerto Edén. José Tonka is the head of one of them, and the images show Tonka, as he calls him, he's called Tonko, 
um, always in a degraded position. Jose is reduced to work, reduced to work in a mine to get sea urchins for his family, and the scene of his current life represent a caricature of his former life, he says, when they were free hunters and divers at the sea. In the same way, the family places are represented as presented as hovels of the civilization. The, deep, the deprivation of the voiceover keeps on digging until exposing the historical Cahuescar heterogeneity in the frame of the Chilean nation. He says it has been 100 years. It has been 100 years since the nomads of the sea were the owners, were the owners of the channels. The dialogue between Cousteau and Tonko's family is developed within the Cahuescar house. The questions through though are always asked by the French. The last scenes of the documentary show what Cousteau was longing for. The last group of Cahuescar hunters sailing, finally the nomads in their element, he says, stating that he knows that their manner of living will disappear. The adventure ends with the certainty of the relevance of his own endeavor, and even the metaphysical connotation that the, eyes, the eye of his camera and the, the technology will be able to register in this new era of knowledge. The spirit of adventure of these canoe people will only survive in history and in the few testimonies of their culture, he says, and he managed to obtain one of those um, testimonies, right? More than 50 years after Serrano's images of Cahuescar people sinking in the rotten soil, and 30 years after Cousteau's omens of the Cahuescar disappearance, we find the little kid we can see saying hello to the French explorer, once again in front of, in front, but also behind the camera. Juan Carlos Tonco, Jose's son, is the producer and the protagonist of the documentary released in 2005, Carl Chamsa, Palo Mojado. The video, directed by Martín Concha and produced with the participation of the community, Cahuescar community of Puerto Den, shows the ancient Cahuescar technique for making a wooden can canoe at the same time that it develops a view on the history and the current state of the Cahuescar people. The making of the canoe is the means to explore and transmit Cahuescar stories in the Cahuescar and Spanish languages, which range from ancient tales to the processes and different manners of negotiation that the Cahuescar people had to endure and were forced to accept throughout time. Modernity brought things, Juan Carlos says, engines and boats, but also took valuable things away. The final part of the video is abundant in statements that establish links between the cultural past and the Cahuescar present, and reinforces the will of resistance of new generations. Nowadays, we are just a few, but we still try to preserve our identity. We have been in a permanent fight against the dominant culture. We remain here, though, and I wonder if nature adapts in all its context. Why can't we do the same if we are part of it, even though some do not consider us as such? Juan Carlos questions anticipate any possible subordinating view at the same time that it establishes a space of freedom for the cultural practice of his people. The question also closes any possibility to respond to the colonial dualism with a reason different from the reason of the oppressed. With Karm Chasna, the Cahuescar people show a channel of communication between two worlds to try to modify the existing relations of power in order to reach a decolonization process. The film's version is certainly different from Custos and proposes a real new era of discovery to consider. There are two important concepts related to the experience of Karl Chamsna. Self-determination in the decision of the Cahuescar people to become the subject of their own history and self-management as a methodological concre concretion, the organic exercise of that right of self-determination. Some years after the release of Karl Chamsna, it can be seen that political self-determination has begun to operate in the Chilean space as well. Since during the last decade, the visibility of the Cahuescar communities has generated an impact in projects that range from business to education. The initiative that stands out in this last area because of the degree of self-management and self-determination of the Cahuescar community started in 2011 and involved the Cahuescar community of Puerto Edén and the University of Magallanes. That year, they signed a cooperation agreement whose objectives were to create spaces of dialogue 
of applied knowledge and intercultural model focus on the indigenous communities, considering aspects of health, environment, traditions, and laws, ethnology and ethnohistory, archives and extensions, art and worldview, technology and resources, and linguistic revitalization. In the signature ceremony, the president of the university stressed the, import the importance and novelty of the agreement between the community and the Chilean state represented by the university. As Juan Carlos Tonko focused on the direction of the measure of the measures announced. The idea is to deliver our knowledge to the Western world. Many areas can develop. That's why we invite you to our territory to work together and to value indigenous knowledge. The activity also meant the eruption of the Gawaskar flag in the Chilean space at the end of the ceremony. And at the end of the ceremony, Gabriela Paterito, one of the elderly women of the community, addressed the people in the Gawaskar language thanking them for the moment and inviting the university scholars to navigate the seas together. Self-management and self-determination are clear here. <clears throat> the invitation is granted by the community in its own language to travel through their territory with, other, with their own flag as a sign of victory and self-assertion, entering officially the Chilean space and from the definition and the modality of the canoe people to navigate together. The program poema, Pueblos Originarios y Su Evolución en Magallanes, as a product of cooperation agreement, of this, this, this cooperation agreement, has developed since, since then different activities linking the scientific research of the university to the interests of the Cahuesca community. Juan Carlos Tonco stated at the presentation of poema, this program, that the ancestral, the ancestral oral knowledge didn't have a value from the point of view of the academy. For him, that the whole community can participate in the definition of different initial aspects of the project meant that the academy had finally validated that knowledge. Research itself is not valuable, but when the community is involved in practical aspects, the value is huge, because the collection of information in flora, fauna, archaeology, anthropology, linguistics, whatever it is, it's validated in situ, and that is the important thing. There is a respect for both types of knowledge in this case. Moreover, the POEMA program has expanded its impact to different aspects such as mechanisms of cooperation for education, energy, and environment. A TV program called Jetakwalok, which teaches Kawaskar language and culture, and other initiatives related to the rescue of the material and natural patrimony of the Kawaskar area. At this point, before finishing, and considering what the Kawaskar people have done, we still have to remember what Lefebvre warns, that this could mean nothing without the production of an appropriate space. So we still have to go a bit further and to complete the view with the moment of 2012 when the Ethnogeographic Guide of Bernardo O'Higgins National Park was published, precisely because this book represents the construction of all production of the Kawaskar space. We can say it's, a symbol it's symbolic as long as it's a textual space, but it's also territorial because it's a description, a demarcation, and a definition of the space historically, historically occupied by the Cahuesca. The book is the product of an expedition of 2010 in which the community informants were part of a project exploring aspects of economy, tourism, science, and the cultural potential of that national, the national park, financed by different govern, government Chilean institutions. The book includes original images and text in Spanish and Cahuescar, the standard alphabet of the Cahuescar language, and what is even more important for us, again, it rereads and reproduces the national space of the National Park from the Cahuescar perspective. Cahuescar people occupy this space and have been here for 6,000 years. The book states that there is no point on the map that does not show the presence of the Cahuescar whether it is because of archaeological traces or because of the top toponymy. Having arrived here, the logical step would be to start reading this guide from the concept of heterotopia. It could be argued, as we did at the beginning, that the representational space contracted by the Cahuesca juxtaposes incompatible spaces, that through this map, the representation of the Chilean territory, considered also toponymy, is contested that looking at the book and the map, the Cahuescar territory would be outside of all places, even though it is possible to indicate their location in reality. 
that this Cahuescar space, in relation to the rest of the national space, has the function of denouncing the most illusory of the hegemonic space called real space. We would have found then a counter-hegemonic heterotopia. But here I must stop and say no. Methodologically speaking, the ethnogeographic guy, Karl Chamsna, the video, Poema project, and the political and communitarian practices of the Cahuescar people can take part in our, in our um, heterotopic analysis. But to consider that way the space they have produced would be somehow to reproduce the space of hegemony. Going back to the definition of the heterotopia then to finish, and after having considered what the Cahuescar people have done once more, we cannot finish without reminding Mr. Foucault that not only the sheep, the heterotopia par excellence can help us to navigate a way to contest hegemony, but also the canoes, right?